Romans 8, 26 and 27. In the same way, the Spirit also helps our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we should, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is, because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we pray we would derive wondrous encouragement from these couple of verses this morning. We find ourselves inadequate to pretty much everything. We are in continual need as, as your creatures of your help and assistance, of your aid, of your grace, your mercy, your forgiveness. And that inadequacy also shows itself even in the very act of what we're doing now in praying. But we're thankful you have not left us alone in this. And I pray that you would encourage us in praying. I, I, I request that our communion with you would be all the sweeter because of a text like this, which should give us great hope and great confidence when we come before you in prayer. I ask all this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. You be seated. Well, we return to Romans 8 and pick up with verse 26. The first word that we come across is the word likewise or in like manner. So we're meant to see a connection between verse 26 and following and the previous context. Now, the most immediate connection that I think comes to us is in a verbal connection between these two verses and the previous ones with the word stenargaos, which means groanings. This whole creation, we're told in verse 22, groans. We ourselves groan, verse 23. And now here in verse 26, we're told that the Holy Spirit intercedes for us with groanings unutterable. It's for this reason we've entitled this, this section of Scripture, Groanings and Glory. For while glory is kind of the bookends to this section, we see throughout the pericope there is groanings found. The Christian faith is lived out with hope of the glory that is to be revealed. But in the present, we find the experience of groaning while we await that coming day. Perhaps an even more important connection, though, is intended with this word likewise. It's true that there's a verbal connection with the word groaning, and we can say, well, he was thinking about groanings and groanings, and so here he thinks about another thing that's engaged in groaning. And certainly there's a tie there, verbally. But the groanings mentioned here are mentioned only as an attendant circumstance or as a manner through which the Holy Spirit is helping believers in prayer. The main idea of these two verses is to talk about the assistance that believers are given when they pray. The bigger connection that's being made here revolves around the Holy Spirit's activity in the life of believers. And that's easy to demonstrate that Romans 8 is all about the Holy Spirit. We, we mentioned this together. Up until Romans 8, you only have a mention of the Spirit or the Holy Spirit like one or two times in the book of Romans. And now obviously you get to Romans 8 and just about every verse has a reference to the Spirit. We saw in verse 2, the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set us free from the law of sin and death. Verse 4, the requirement of the law is fulfilled in those walking by the Spirit. Verse 6, the mind set on the Spirit is life and peace. Verses 9 and 11, the Spirit of God dwells in us and will give life to our mortal bodies. Verse 13, those living by the Spirit put to death the deeds of the body. Verse 14, all those led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. Verse 15, by the Spirit we have been adopted and cry out, Abba, Father. Verse 16, the Spirit testifies himself with our spirit that we are children of God. And then verse 17, the Spirit declares that we are heirs of God, joint heirs or fellow heirs with Christ, sharing in his suffering but also in his coming resurrection. The Spirit is all over Romans 8. So when we get to verse 18 to about verse 30, what we largely have in this little section is an explanation as to how 
these glorious, wondrous privileges that Christians have been given in the Spirit, how that fits with the experience we, ex, with the experience we have in the present life. We've been told we have freedom from sin and death, adoption to God's family. We've been made heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus Christ about a coming glory that is to, to come to us. But how does this all fit with the present Christian experience that we encounter? Much suffering, much pain, much trial, much tribulation. Groanings are experienced during this time of the in-between, from between promise and fulfillment. Creation is groaning and longing. We saw last week, believers are groaning and longing, but we do so in hope of coming glory. So technically, there's, this is still within the framework of the Spirit's role in redemptive history. So Paul, yes, there's a connection to this term groanings, which connects with the previous verses. But I think the better context for understanding the word likewise is all of chapter 8. He's describing the role, the activity, the, the, the work of the Holy Spirit within believers' lives. And in particular, what's kind of running through Romans 8 is assurance that comes to us as God's children, that we are his children because the Holy Spirit is operating in us. Only those who are saved by God's grace, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, have the indwelling Holy Spirit. So if you see these things evident in you, it's, it's signs of life. It's signs of adoption. It shows that you're one of God's children. And so I think this likewise is connecting that way. It's, there's a wondrous assurance to believers that the Spirit is helping us in prayer. And likewise, the Spirit is helping our weakness. Look at it there again in verse 26. Likewise, or in the same way, the Spirit is helping in our weakness. For when we have not known what to pray for as we ought, the Holy Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings unutterable. And the one searching the hearts and has known the mind of the Spirit because according to God, according to God's will, he intercedes for the saints. So in part five of Groanings in Glory, we're going to be drawn to the beautiful mystery of prayer this morning. And what we have to do is we're going to have to admit our weakness in prayer, then thank God for the help he provides us in prayer, and then lastly be encouraged to faithfulness in prayer. Let's begin with talking about admitting our weakness in prayer. We have to start here. We have to admit our need in prayer. The context for God helping us is that we know our need. Need is a distinctly creaturely term. We have many and varied needs, and all of them are provided by God, our Creator, who himself has no needs. He's the kind of slightly fancy word, aseity, when you're talking about God, that he it means ase, on himself. God depends on himself. He has no needs. All of his needs are fulfilled within himself. But we as God's creatures have all kinds of needs. Uh, be cautioned. If anyone ever says to you some statement like God needs, you can just stop them right there. Unless they say nothing. <laughs> then they're right. But if they say God needs fellowship, God needs love, God needs your help, God needs your service, they're wrong. God has no need He's sovereign. He's over all, in all, through all. He sustains all. He upholds all. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. I love how that sometimes the prophets would rebuke the children of Israel with this, right? Like, you know, don't act as if God needs your sacrifices. He does not need you. Again, the word need applies to us. It does not apply to our creator. Besides all of our physical needs like food and water and clothing and shelter, we have emotional needs and psychological needs and sociological needs. And even more important, we have spiritual needs. We are sinners before a holy God and we're in need of restored relationship with him. That restored relationship is only possible through God's own work on our behalf. God sent his only begotten son to come to this earth, fulfill all righteousness, and then die as a substitutionary sacrifice in the stead of those who would believe in him. The one and only means for men to be made right with God is for them to repent of their sin and trust in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And when it comes to discussing prayer, we must start here. 
We do not do a lost world any favors by encouraging them to pray when they're not right with God. They cannot, their prayers go unheard. We kind of have a, I think in our present culture, it's kind of moved away from like moments for prayer into moments of silence. And on some levels, that's actually more appropriate because most of these people don't know Jesus, don't have right relationship with God. And so while they might be talking to themselves or something else, they're, they're not engaging in prayer. They don't have access to God their Father. You see, apart from salvation by grace through faith, we have no access to God's presence. In order to talk to God, you have to obtain an introduction to him. You have to, be gained, you have to gain an audience with him. Certainly, when you think of examples of this in the material world, like if you wanted to meet with the President of the United States, you'd have to be given access to him. You would, not, you would need to be granted an audience. You would have to be given an introduction. Without that, any attempted communication with the President of the United States would be null and void. Isaiah 59, 1 and 2 kind of explains this predicament. Behold, the Lord's hand is not so short that it cannot save, nor his ear so dull that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. The first thing that we have to tell a man who is lost is that he must be reconciled to God first before hoping that any of his prayers are being heard. 2 Corinthians 5.20 says that we are ambassadors of Christ. As though God were pleading through us, making an appeal through us. We beg others that they be reconciled to God on behalf of Christ. A man must first be reconciled to God in order to have relationship, access into God's presence to commune with him in prayer. But that's somewhat, I think, assumed here, Right? He's, he's writing to the Christians there in Rome, to the church in Rome. You see, even after salvation and being, ac give, being given access to God's presence, or we can go even further, being encouraged to draw near with confidence to the throne of grace, see Hebrews 4.16, we still have to admit our creaturely weakness. And those weaknesses affect our prayers. Think about just a couple, this is a, a smattering of a few verses in the New Testament that speak about our prayers and what might hinder our prayers. James 4.2 says, we might not have purely because we have failed to ask. You have not because you have asked not. Then the next verse, you might ask for something and still not receive it because you've asked with impure motives. James 4.3. Our prayers also might be hindered by our failure to honor our spouses. See 1 Peter 3, 7. There it's talking to husbands in particular. Dwell with your wives in a gentle, understanding manner. And it says in there, so that your prayers are not hindered. We might pray to be seen by others and receive our reward in full. See Matthew 6, 5. We might wrongly think that we'll be heard for our many words. See Matthew 6, 7. We might lack perseverance in praying, see Luke 18. We might pray in doubt, say, see James 1, 6, Mark 11, 23, Matthew 21, 21. But the word asthenia here does not indicate, does not necessitate a meaning that's connected or implying sin. The word is translated here weakness, and I think that's a good translation, we could also translate it frailty or feebleness. The word also is used to translate, uh, is translated in some places as sickness or illness. As a matter of fact, that's the way this word is used pretty much entirely through the Gospels. So Matthew 8, 17, Luke 5, 15, Luke 8, 2, Luke 13, 11, and 12, John 5, 5, John 11, 4. And then into Acts, Acts 28, 9. We see it even happening two times in the epistles, uh, Galatians 4.13, 1 Timothy 5.23. In all those cases, it's translated sickness or illness. But in the rest of its New Testament occurrences, the word is translated weakness or frailty. What we have here is an acknowledgement of the human condition. Even when we are redeemed, we are still yet beset with creaturely limitations, and those limitations, those weaknesses, impact our prayers. Those weaknesses impact all of our lives, but certainly they also impact our praying. 
We know this word, by the way, does not demand a sinful connection because it could be used to describe Jesus' own incarnate position. Remember in Romans 8, 3, we were told that God sent his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. And we spent some time talking about that, the likeness of sinful flesh. If you connect that with Hebrews 5, 2, which talks about one of the qualifications of a high priest is that a high priest could, would deal gently with the ignorant and the misguided since he himself is also beset with weakness. High priests were also beset with weakness. In other words, the priests of Israel should be able to identify with their people. Why? Because they knew what it was to be weak. Now by that, that word weakness does not necessarily implicate someone as engaging in sin. It could just be the creaturely limitations that come to us as a result of being weak. And we think about Jesus' own incarnation, right? He would grow tired. He's there, remember one famous example where he's asleep on a cushion in the boat while there's a massive storm going on? I mean, he must have been exhausted, right? How many of you are going to be sleeping <laughs> during a massive storm at sea? I, I certainly wouldn't be, right? And there's Jesus sleeping. We know that he experienced the weaknesses of the human condition, and yet he was without sin. Lloyd-Jones explains, our Lord was entirely free from sin, but he experienced some of these infirmities to which we are subject and to which we are heir. This was essential in his work as our great high priest and representative, as Hebrews 5 reminds us. Creaturely weaknesses are not in themselves sinful, but they certainly do affect our present sojourn. And see, what's different about us than Jesus is Jesus was sinless and perfect, whereas a lot of times what happens for us with creaturely weakness is it becomes context for us engaging in sin, right? I'm tired, and therefore I now try to excuse being short with my wife or snapping at one of my kids, right? Like, oh, well, it's just because I was tired. It's a long day. Well, yeah, you were tired, and you do have creaturely weakness, but yet that doesn't excuse the sin that you just engage in. But often for us, these things do get connected. But I just want you to recognize that to admit that I'm weak as it relates to prayer is not itself an admission of sin. It can be just an admission of creatureliness. In other words, you don't have it all together. You don't have all information. Have you ever been faced with that conundrum in praying? How do I pray for this person right now when I don't really know all of the attendant circumstances that they're going through? Which direction should I pray for? How do I pray here? A particularly poignant example of this, I think, is found in 2 Corinthians 12. This is what's so fascinating. We had, we had it read just a few moments ago. The word weakness occurs four times in that chapter. Four times, this word, asthenia. Paul explains that he will not boast on behalf of himself except in regard to his weaknesses. And in further explanation, Paul mentions some incredible visions that a man was given. Which almost everybody is he's talking about himself there. So he was given an incredible vision to the third heaven, we're told. But in order to maintain his humility, we're told here that the Lord gave Paul a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan, to keep him from exalting himself. Paul prayed three times that it be removed, but the answer was given to him from the Lord. My grace is sufficient for you, for my power, or for power is perfected in weakness. Now, not only does this passage have some interesting and verbal parallels, the same Greek word happening multiple times there in 2 Corinthians 12, as we see it here in Romans 8, but it also shares a thematic connection as well. Paul's weakness manifested itself even in the sheer fact that he didn't know how to pray. Note, he's praying against God's will for him when he says, remove this thorn. He prays, he tells us, three times. Here's the Apostle Paul engaged in communication with his Lord. And he admits here he was praying wrong. He's praying for it to be removed. I mean, it's natural that Paul might pray for the removal of something that appeared to be an obstacle to his ministry. Like, if this messenger of Satan sent to buffet me, to torment me, was taken away, just think about how much more ministry I could engage in, right? Right? I'm certain that his motivations here seem good. Like, certainly this thorn in the flesh should be removed. This obstacle taken out of my life. See, this is an interesting moment. Paul had a need. He indeed had a need. But it wasn't the one that he thought he had. You see, he thought that his besetting problem was the pain he was experiencing from the thorn in his flesh. But the Lord taught him that the thorn was necessary to prevent Paul from another danger, 
the danger of exalting himself. You see, it wasn't the problem of pain that Paul most needed in that moment. It was a problem of pride. And God was using a thorn which brought pain to Paul to prevent him from becoming arrogant and boastful. Because Paul had been given things by God's grace that not many people have ever been given. Notably, an entrance to the third heavens, whatever that is, right? He says, unutterable things happened. Can't even talk about it. Then God says, I've shown you that to encourage your heart for the task in front of you, but now in order to make sure you remain properly humble before me, you're going to be given a thorn. And Paul, get this, is praying against the very gift that God has given him because he doesn't want the thorn, and yet God is using that to provide for him what he really needs. Have you ever been there in prayer? Have you ever found praying hard because you don't know which way to pray? I mean, the flesh will immediately say, get rid of pain, right? So if I'm sick, Lord, take away the sickness. That's like immediate, like knee-jerk reaction, right? But have any of you ever experienced some real spiritual growth through times of sickness? Such that while the pain wasn't fun, the Lord taught you lessons you might not have learned otherwise? Have you ever wanted an obstacle removed from your life because it was just really a thorn in your side? But then with maybe the benefit of hindsight 2020, you can look back and go, God had that in my life on purpose. Here we have at least a specific example from the Apostle Paul himself where he says, I was wrong. I prayed three times that it be removed and I was wrong. The Lord wanted me to have that thorn you see, what this highlights to us is that we have ignorance about what to pray for. Our ignorance of what to pray for. Notice how Romans 8.26 explains our weakness. Now, the, here is an interesting case. I, you guys know in general I, I preach from the NAS. I'm kind of an NAS fanboy, you know. Um, but here's a case where I just, I don't like the NAS reading as much as some of the others. The NAS reads here, For we do not know how to pray as we should kind of leaves it enigmatic as to what is being communicated there. The ESV here is better, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought. The King James has it, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought. The NIV says, we do not know what we ought to pray for. And I think that translation, what, is way better than how here. The word in Greek is T, and it's even... the. It has the article before, so tati, there's actually gar in between there, which means four. So it goes ta, gar, ti. So the four goes to the beginning. For the what? The what is the way it reads literally. There's a word in Greek, pos, which means how. You could have said, you could have said ti or ta, pos, but he doesn't. He says tati. He says the what, not the how. So the emphasis here is not on the how we are able to pray, Again, I would point you to, how is it that we're able to pray? Christ. That's how we're able to pray. We've been brought into the Holy of Holies by the blood of Jesus that we can bring our requests before our Father in heaven. We can enter with boldness. That's the how. But the emphasis of this text is not the how, but the what. Our weakness is shown in that we sometimes are ignorant about what to pray for. It's the content of our prayers that we have to admit ignorance regarding in some cases. It is the as we ought, what we should pray for as we ought, as is fitting is another translation there. What is the fitting thing for me to pray right here, right now? And because of creaturely limitations, sometimes I'm like, I don't know what to pray. I don't really know how to handle this. This does not mean, by the way, that we have no direction when it comes to prayer. This doesn't reduce us to saying, like, oh, we never know what to pray for. That's not true at all. There's all kinds of instruction given to us regarding prayer. Just to pick two quick examples, consider the Lord's Prayer. I think better said the example prayer in Matthew 6. You guys do remember, it's, it's fine if you've memorized the Lord's Prayer, just like you know, the, the example prayer, just as you might memorize any par other portion of Scripture. But please don't take this example prayer, and then make it into a meaningless mantra or repetition. How do I know you not to do that? Because Jesus says it himself. There are people who think they're heard for their many words. 
So don't then make this, which he says, pray in this manner. Pray like this. Here's an exemplary prayer for you to engage in. Because in, uh, I think it's Luke 10 or Luke 11, the, um, where you have the other like occurrence of this prayer. Either it's on a different occasion or it's another recounting of the same occasion. But on that one, the disciples like preempt it. They say, Lord, teach us to pray. They're, they're asking him to help them. It says, John, the Baptist disciples got instruction from John. Jesus, you give us instruction on how to pray. So we have instruction. Pray then in this way. Pray like this. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. And do not lead us into, into temptation, but deliver us from evil. We see Paul's prayer in Ephesians 1 is another good example of this, which we had read just a few moments ago, starting in verse 18, where he talks about, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened, that you might know what is the hope of his calling, the riches of, the, of his glory, of his inheritance in the saints, what is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe, and he goes on and on. There is content for our prayers. If you're wondering, what can I pray about? Spend some time in the scriptures. Allow the scriptures to inform your praying. You know, Donald Whitney has a book on praying the scriptures. Um, one of the places he would direct you to is like the book of Psalms. The Psalms are just full of this, right? It's just communicate God's revelation to us about how to talk to him. Right? So this, these are praise and worship and they can, they're prayers. So learn from them. We ought to endeavor to learn as much as we can from scripture regarding not only how, but what to pray for. And the majority of our time can be spent praying for things that we know God desires and is absolutely in line with his moral will. There's all kinds of stuff for us to know for certain God is pleased with this. So spend your prayer time, most of your time, on those things. Like, I know he wants the eyes of my heart to be enlightened. I know that he wants me to grow in sanctification. I know he wants me, me to be courageous with the gospel. Pray for those things. And yet there will be specifics and situations for which we pray that we lack knowledge about God's sovereign will about. God has not told us specifically what he intends to do. So what do we do then? We might also find ourselves in situations where we're overwhelmed emotionally and we just find it hard to express ourselves to the Lord. If we're being honest, we might be angry with God right now and so we're having a hard time talking to him about what's going on. We might find a particular trial or hardship beyond our ability to cope with and that words are just hard to come by. We might not be able to comprehend how the situation that we're facing right now fits into God's plan and it causes us to doubt and worry and be angry and all the hosts of emotions and just be flooded with all of that. You see, our finitude, our weaknesses, our limited vision might make it hard for us to pray. MacArthur says, uh, helpfully, many times we're not even aware that spiritual needs exist, much less know how best they should be met. Even the Christian who prays sincerely, faithfully, and regularly cannot possibly know God's purposes concerning all his own needs or the needs of others for whom he prays. Again, if Paul's a good example of this, he's praying for a thorn to be removed when that's exactly what he needs right then. So are we left to despair when we lack words or direction in prayer? What do we do when we don't know what to say? Still remember a particular day some years ago, we were in the midst of, we had our, our, our Christian school still at that time. I was acting as headmaster of the school, and we were having trouble with City Hall next door. There was impending potential of the road going right through the sanctuary where you're sitting right now. We were trying to navigate all the things that were going on with that. I was feeling a bit overwhelmed. And then I remember Randy coming into my office and telling me that the city had just sent us a letter saying that we had to install sprinkler systems throughout the entire complex. And I'm like, what? Like, I thought we're grandfathered. And we went through this huge, long discussion and debate, and I was already feeling overwhelmed. And I can just remember in that moment just being feeling like, you know, it wasn't this bad, but feeling like the weight of the world is on my shoulders, feeling like, you know, I've got 50 people's jobs back here, and our church ministry and everything else. And I remember just being, looking at Randy and say, I seriously don't know what to do. I don't even know how to pray right now. Like, I'm just so overwhelmed. And I can remember both of us, like I literally laid down on the carpet in my office and just wept before the Lord, asking like, 
what do, I, what do we even do? I can remember after that time of prayer with Randy, I can remember experiencing what I couldn't describe other than just like a peace that surpasses all understanding, a, a feeling of like, it's going to be okay, but I don't know how. And, um, and it wasn't as if all of the problems just vanished and went away. For whatever reason, they stopped asking about sprinklers, so that's good. <laughs> Hope they don't watch this sermon. Um, anyway, um, <laughs> but uh, it was a moment where I remember praying, Lord, I don't even know what to say to you right now. Like, I don't even know how to express all that I'm feeling. I, I don't even know how to exactly ask. I don't know what you're doing with this. I don't know what you're accomplishing. I don't know why there's so much animosity with us in next door. I was just full of questions and had no real direction. Like, I could feel my flesh saying, well, just take care of this. But I, I knew that wasn't necessarily the right way, but I didn't know what to do. And it's one of those moments I still look back to in connection with a passage like this where I felt there was some sort of supernatural peace I was given. We, we walked out of my office with no, no more answers than we had before we started praying. But we just saw then slowly over the next few weeks and months, things just fall into place as we just took each step as it went. And as many of you know, the bigger issues with City Hall, you know, continued for many, many more years even after that. It wasn't as if all things just evaporated. But there was a supernatural peace provided. And I do believe that it was, an, it was a moment in which the Holy Spirit was engaged in providing us with help when we didn't know what to say. That brings us to the main point of this pericope. Look at this point two. Thank God for help in prayer. Notice this. The Spirit assists in petition. The word help here in the Greek is really fascinating. It's a super, super long word. It's one of these rare, rare cases. A lot of times when there's like translation from one language to another, especially from Greek to English, usually like the Greek um, is less words and then the English is more words to try to describe the same Greek term. But here's like the flip-flop. Sunanti lambanathai is the word there. Huge word, translated help. Um, the word literally is broken down. If you break down all the little parts of that, soon means with. Anti means alongside or against or in the place of. And then lambano means to receive or to take, to, to seize, to lay hold of. So you put all that together, it's something like to lay hold of with or together alongside of someone or in the place of someone. So it kind of has all that together. And so the word means to like, it communicates the scenario where someone else is carrying a load and somebody else helps them. I asked Joel the other day to help me manipulate some uh, three quarter inch MDF plywood in my garage, stuff super heavy and super bulky and awkward. And if you're trying to put it through a table saw, it's not a fun thing if you're by yourself. And so just having Joel out there with me, letting him just bear a little bit of the load, helping me keep everything straight as I was pushing through, made all the difference. Pastor Christian's sermon from Family Camp in Galatians 6, highly recommend your listening. All the Family Camp sermons, if you haven't listened to them, go listen to them. But this is really, really great. Uh, Pastor Christian, the words that you said have really stuck in my head, the whole idea of like, you know, the problem that we're beset with is that we want to mind other people's business and look out for ourselves when we should flip that, right? Mind my own business and look out for others. And this term here, this word help, it, it, there's only one other time that this big compound word translated help happens in the New Testament. And guess where it happens? It's in Luke 10, verse 38 and following. That story is a story of Mary and Martha. You remember this occasion? Jesus comes to visit. Martha is preparing Prepara making preparations for Jesus. And where's Mary? She's sitting at Jesus' feet, right? And remember, Martha comes in. She's exasperated. She's like, Jesus, tell my sister to help me. That's the word that's used here. It's a big, long word. Tell her to help me. Remember, Jesus says that she's picked the, the better of the things right now. You're worried with many things. She's concerned with the right thing here. But this is that same word. Now, understand, Martha wasn't telling Mary to just take over it all. She's asking for Mary to lend her a hand in the preparations. And I think it's a helpful thing for us to understand here. The idea is this, not that we stop praying, but that we pray knowing that the Holy Spirit is helping. It's not a replacement for prayer. If you read this and go, oh, I guess the Holy Spirit is just taking care of it, so I don't have to do anything. No. <laughs> the term here is help, aid, support, provide. So we're to engage in prayer while we know that the aid of the Holy Spirit is happening, which is attending to that same activity, as we're engaged in prayer, 
When we come to matters in particular that we don't know how to pray, the Holy Spirit lays hold of these unspoken requests and intercedes on our behalf. He's making an intercession with groaning. The Spirit intercedes with groaning, praying on our behalf, speaking where we can't. And this communication, note here, is without words, an unutterable groaning. We've already come across the word groaning two times in this text. I already mentioned the whole of creation groaning, believers groaning. But now in this case, uh, now in this case we have the Holy Spirit groaning. And these groanings are said to be unutterable. Or another way of saying it is groaning without words. Groaning that is speechless, wordless. When we thought of the other two examples, creation groaning, well obviously that's without words, right? Because we're talking about all the stuff that's other than believers there. And we also dis distinguish that not the angels and stuff either. Or even fallen man. But we're talking about animals and the rest of creation. That's what's groaning. That's not with words. That's metaphorical language there. Here it becomes emphatic. The Spirit's intercession is wordless groaning. There's no words here. Some posit that this... Groaning cannot be originating in the, in the spirit for how could the spirit engage, engage in groaning? For some, they've looked at this text and they've said it's below the state of the spirit to be engaged in some sort of activity like groaning. They don't feel it's fitting to the estate of the Holy Spirit. But I personally don't understand how that conclusion is required here, especially when we read the straightforward text. It seems to me that they're making a theological position on whether or not the Spirit can groan before they come to the text, which seems to me, at least, to be clearly saying that the Spirit is groaning. Now, those who argue that way say that it's the believer who's groaning, and it's the Spirit who then picks up on that groaning and then intercedes for him. Um, but again, I feel like we've already just gotten done talking about the believer's groaning. That was the previous couple of verses. Now we're talking about the Spirit who's interceding with groanings unutterable. I would also further say this, if the spirit can be grieved, see Ephesians 4.30, why can't he groan? If, in other words, if the argument is that God cannot be moved by emotion, and some of this, I want to just say, some of this flows from the idea of God's immutability, that God is unchanging, and I will be first to admit that there is mystery here, right? If God is unchanging, how can he one moment feel joy and the next moment feels sorrow, or how could he be elated and groan? How, how could this happen simultaneously? And again, this is where I say this is beyond creaturely understandings. Yes, creatures are limited, but even we could say on some level, and again, the analogies break down, is it possible for a human to experience both joy and sadness at the same time? I've experienced some of that. So, you could also say there might be an anthropomorphism here. Scripture often refers to God with, with terms that are likened to the human experience in order for us to help understand God. But I think just an out-of-hand statement about this where the exegesis seems very plainly to be reading that it's the Holy Spirit interceding with groanings that are wordless. I, I think to just say right out of the bat that the Spirit cannot be engaging in groaning seems to just stand against the, just the plain reading of the text to me. So I would rather say the Spirit is groaning. His intercession is with a groaning that's without words. And there's some amount of mystery as to how this happens, how this is experienced in the Godhead. But I'd rather stay there personally with the exegesis than go the other way. I like the way the Mount said it. There is no reason to deny emotional or spiritual involvement in prayer to the third person of the Trinity. And then he says, here again, we stand at the edge of mystery. I agree with him. There's mystery here. It's hard, to, it's hard for us to grapple with. We're talking about the nature and character of God, and there are things that are beyond us. But my point would be to say, I think it is the Spirit's groaning that's being referred to here, and it's wordless, and there's a mystery to it. But in other words, the Spirit is emotionally invested in us too. You see, I, the problem I have sometimes in the way you end up defining immutability is if God then has no emotion, then it's like we have something that God doesn't. We have emotions. Where do those come from? I'd much rather say that God does have emotions and somehow they fit in his immutability. So again, remember, his knowledge is perfect of everything. So that would mean that simultaneously at this exact moment, right, there's somebody weeping and crying that he's attending to. And there's somebody in the throes of joy because maybe they just come to know Christ, right? And God is experienced. He knows all of that all at once, right? In his perfect infinitude. So I'd rather just say I have no problem with the spirit groaning and that groaning somehow fits with all the rest that the Holy Spirit is as well. 
I'd also like to point out one other thing from this text, and that is that there are some who see in these verses a reference to speaking in tongues, the glossolalia. But I think, again, this is another example of trying to uh, insert a theological position into an otherwise, which is into a otherwise straightforward text that doesn't say anything of the nature. So what, what some have said, especially those of charismatic leaning, is that this is a reference to like, when you, you don't know what to pray, you start speaking in tongues. So I have a couple problems with that. Number one, the problem is you don't have words. Number two, it says it's the spirit that is interceding for you. It's not you, the spirit is doing it. Number three, they're called unutterable groanings. Groanings without words. So wordless groanings. It's not saying you need another language to express this. It's saying that words don't attend to it. It's beyond words. Words aren't able to be employed. Words won't suffice. And one other thing I would say is the gift of tongues, as it's mentioned in 1 Corinthians 12. You also see it in, in chapter 14. There's a bigger, expansive study. If you want to go and listen to my sermons from that, we've already gone through 1 Corinthians, so you can listen to my view on all of that stuff if you want to. And I'd love to talk to you further about it if you have some questions or you disagree with me. be happy to meet with you and talk with you a little bit more about it. But I'll just say this, 1 Corinthians 12.30 it indicates that not everyone had the gift of tongues even in the early church context. But when I read here in Romans 8, I get no indication that this is just limited to some. As a matter of fact, listen to what it says, to those, um, uh, because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. In other words, that's broadly, that's all the saints, that's all of God's people. So whatever 1 Corinthians 12, 30, where it says that some have the gift of tongues and some don't, well, here it says that this intercession is for all the saints. So anyway, those are just a few comments in response to that. You'll sometimes hear people look, point to this text and say that this is what speaking in tongues is or some sort of prayer language. Um, I don't think that's at all what's being talked about here. I would just also mention this, that several commentators are right to point out that this is the beauty of the Trinity. So we have God the Father, right, that we're praying to. And we now are told here in this text that the Holy Spirit is interceding for us, right? He's interceding, taking up these wordless groanings right to the Father's throne. And not only that, but look down at verse 34. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died, yes, rather, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. Get this, Holy Spirit within us, interceding for us. Jesus Christ at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty, interceding for us. We have the Holy Spirit praying for us. We have Jesus Christ praying for us. See how much, a, how much more we have to talk about? You, you understand here how ridiculous the idea within Roman Catholicism is that we have to like petition to Mary to get a request through to Jesus? You know, well, he's, she's his mother, so we need to talk to her. Maybe then she'll warm Jesus up to us. What are you talking about? Jesus is at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, interceding for us right now. The Holy Spirit's within us, interceding for us with groanings too deep for words, wordless groanings. We've been given so much in Christ. Don't try to deify Christians who have gone before us. They would do the same thing. They would rebuke that, and they would say, they would point us to Jesus, Jesus is the one and only mediator between God and man. And then the Holy Spirit comes and dwells within us and such that the Holy Spirit and Jesus are always living to make intercession for us. See, see Hebrews 7, 25. Jesus, always able to save forever those who draw near to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. So we've seen how God has met our weakness with the provision by the Holy Spirit. But I think lastly, we, we might ask at this point, what value comes from unutterable groanings, right? Like, what's the practical benefit? So you're saying, you're out of words, and then I'm saying, but the Lord has provided for you. And what has he provided? Well, they're wordless groanings that the Spirit's doing. You're like, what? Like, how is that helping me? I don't, I don't get it. So here... Here's how this all ties together. And point three, take great encouragement in prayer. We are meant from this text to be driven to prayer. If you're not reading this, if you don't, if you don't land there, you're not reading the text right. This, this text is meant to give us great impetus to pray. Why? Because if there's one time when you really don't want to pray, it's when you don't know what to say. And this text says when you don't know what to say, pray. Because the Holy Spirit's going to be there. He's going to be interceding in those moments. So in the worst moments of your life, the moments when you feel you have nothing to say, this text says, you better be praying. You better be praying because the Holy Spirit's going to aid in that moment. He's going to take regrets. Look at how this works. 
This is how this works. Look at verse 27. He who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. Here is, here is the crux of the matter. There's a tremendous comfort that comes to us as believers when we know who the Lord is. This is just a, just a bit of theology proper. Who is God? God is the one who knows everything. God is the one who knows our hearts. Think about this passage that talk about this. 2 Samuel 16, 7. God looks on the heart. He doesn't see as man does. He sees the heart. See 1 Chronicles 28, 9. Think about Jeremiah 17. The heart is deceitful above all else. Desperate look at it. Who can understand it? I, the Lord, search the heart. So, so the Lord knows the heart. Right? He not only knows your words. He knows what's going on in your heart. And notice also, he knows the Spirit's mind. See 1 Corinthians 2.11, who knows the mind of the Lord, but he was a spirit, right? So there is nothing hidden from his gaze. He knows, speaking of the Holy Spirit, not only what to say, but when to say it and how to say it. And the Lord knows not only what we say, but he knows why we say it and what we're thinking and what we're longing for. And so when we find ourselves in weakness without knowledge of what to pray for regarding a situation, we can admit that and trust that the Holy Spirit is interceding on our behalf with unutterable groanings. This is maybe a, be a freeing moment for some of you in this room. When you don't know what to pray in prayer, say that to the Lord. I don't know what to say and I need help. I need help. This could go a multitude of directions. And Lord, I'm submitted to you. I trust you. I love you. I know you're my father. Please, Holy Spirit, intercede for me. You see, God hears and understands unutterable groanings. See, this is another creaturely limitation. Do you hear and understand unutterable groanings? I sure don't. I, sure, I can't even rightly interpret a lot of wording, word, wordful groanings, right? I don't know how to say that. Anyway, groans that, that show themselves with tears or in some sort of physical way. You, know, you can misinterpret tears, can't you? We can misinterpret sighs. Is it trouble? Are you overjoyed? Are you overwhelmed? Remember in 1 Samuel 1, guys' Bible study, Eli the priest comes up to Hannah and had, Hannah, we're told, is like she's burdened in spirit and she's, her lips are moving, but there's no words coming out. And so what does Eli think? Drunk. She's drunk. And so he comes over to her with that and she's like, I'm not, I'm not drunk. Like, I'm just bearing my heart before the Lord. The priest misinterprets her groaning. And we do that for one another. Was it a week ago? I showed up early to my daughters, I took Ashton to her volleyball game, and I was instantly met with, it's kind of a funny story, it's a longer story, but I'll, I'll try to keep it shortly, just because my wife says I can't tell a short story. So, so I came in there, I'm sitting down on the bench, and before the coach got there, coach comes in, and I'm like, hey coach, and she's like, oh, I'm glad you're sitting over here, you're the assistant coach today. And I was like, what? And she's like, yeah, she, our assistant coach is not going to be here, I need you to, to just do this. I'm like, oh, okay, yeah, 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 I'm, I can do this. And so... They start warming up, and I get out there, and I'm warming up with Ashton at first, and then Evie comes over, my, my niece, and so I'm warming up with her, and I'm walking back to make a set, and I s collide with another student person on our team. We both crumple to the ground, and I see her laughing, or so I thought she was laughing. So at first I'm like, oh, we kind of got tangled up there. Sorry about that. And then I'm realizing, oh, she's actually hurt. It's like, great. In my first act as assistant coach, I have injured a player on our team. This is perfect. This is going well. Um, it turned out later she ended up being okay. She ended up even playing in the game. So that, that was great. So there's just a little bit of, uh, you know, any cool points I had that day were completely gone for sure. Um, probably never asked to be assistant coach again. But, but I will say this. In that moment, I did not know how to interpret her groaning. I actually thought she was maybe chuckling and laughing because it was kind of comical because our legs kind of got tangled and we both fell over. It's almost like one of those slow-mo fallings, you know? Like, so I was like, oh, that was, that was weird and funny kind of. And then she's laughing. So I'm like, oh, that's funny. Wait, is she laughing or is she crying? I can't tell. Um, and maybe you've had that kind of moment. We have moments where we can't understand and interpret groaning, but that's never a problem for the Lord. He knows exactly what's going on inside of the heart. 
Nothing is missed by him. Nothing is lost in translation when the Spirit intercedes with wordless groaning for the Father who knows the mind of the Spirit. Like the way Moose said it, here's one potent source for our patient fortitude with which we await our glory, verse 25, that our failure to understand God's purposes and plans to see the beginning from the end does not mean that effective, powerful prayer for our specific needs is absent. Get this, just because you can't see the end from where you are doesn't mean that God doesn't see the end from where you are and the Holy Spirit is interceding purposely in those moments and his intercessions, wordless groanings, are perfectly heard by the Father. Gives me to my last thing. The Spirit works according to God's will. This is so crucial here. The Apostle Paul was expressing being pressed between two options in Philippians 1, where he says, you know, if I was taken out of this world, it would be much better for me, but to remain here for you is better for you. And we, like Paul, might have moments like that where we have indecision about the Lord's sovereign will. We don't know what to do. And so we should do what Paul does. Leave it in the Lord's sovereign hands. The Spirit perfectly knows the Father's will. So his intercessions are flawless. He intercedes with perfect knowledge of the Father's ways. And the Father, who hears and understands perfectly unutterable groanings, is able to answer those perfectly. There's glorious hope here found in awkward moments of prayer. We're not left alone when we're left without words. You're not left alone when you find yourself left without words. The Spirit comes to the aid of believers baffled by the perplexity of prayer, Mount says, and takes those concerns to God with an intensity far greater than we could ever imagine. In that moment when you feel weakest, you are actually strongest. In that moment when you are without words, the Holy Spirit is interceding without words in a more powerful way you, than you could with words. So in the moments when you feel least wanting to pray, dear brother and sister, pray. Engage in it. When you feel, I'm a person with many words, if I feel without words, I'm actually in a better place in those moments. You see, in closing, let's return to the word likewise. We've already established that the connection to be made here involves more than merely a third reference to groaning. In fact, the groaning of Romans 8, 26 and 27 is just a means to an end. The groaning of the Spirit is made in the context of intercession. This text is meant to inspire another reason for confidence and assurance in relationship with our God. Just as the Spirit testifies with our spirit that we are the children of God, just as the Spirit causes us to cry out, Abba, Father, just as the Spirit leads us and guides us and directs us, just as the Spirit gives life to our mortal bodies... Just as the, the, the Spirit is engaged in all of those things, he is presently right now at work in view of our weaknesses. He's at work in prayer. He's interceding for us with unutterable groanings. Rather than shying away from prayer when you don't know what to say, we're encouraged to dive in all the more. Perhaps you've heard the song, Just Say, say Jesus. I definitely have heard that several times on KSBJ before. It's about seventh time down. The words go, when you don't know what to say, just say Jesus. There's power in the name, the name of Jesus. If the words won't come because you're just too afraid to pray, just say Jesus. And while I appreciate the call to prayer in those moments, they're right there. In other words, if you don't know what to say, don't, don't just retreat from the Lord. Go to the Lord. They're right about that. But the truth is better than what they have to say there. This is what I get at. They're right to say when you don't know what to say and you're fearful of praying, pray anyway. They're right. And they're right about who you got to go to. It's through Jesus. Without Jesus, you have no access to the Father. So that's all right. So I don't mean to totally bash them, but I want to say there's better things for us. It's better things for us. The first thing I'll say this. When you don't know what to pray, start with what you do know to pray. If you don't know what to say about this situation, put it on hold for a minute. And pray about the things you know God is pleased with. You can always spend time in prayer with further adoration and thanksgiving. Spend some time praising the Lord. Sing a song of praise unto the Lord. Sing a hymn. And when you're lost about what to say about a particular matter, spend some more time praying about things that you're very certain that God is pleased with. Pray that God's name be exalted. Pray that sinners be granted repentance and faith. Pray that Christians would grow in spiritual maturity and readiness to share the gospel with others. You can always pray for greater love for the Lord. Pray for greater love for others. Pray for advancement in holiness. Pray for courage to stand for Christ. You can also spend some time recounting wonderful promises that God has given. Not to like stick it to God and hold it to him, but to say thank you for the promises you've given. I trust that you are fulfilling all of these things. Count your blessings. Name them one by one. And then after you've done that, now return to that matter that you sidelined for a moment. And now from this attitude of submission and worship, 
Go before the Lord and tell him straightforwardly, I don't know what to pray about this. I don't know which direction this is to, be go, to go. I'm without words. And then remember that the Holy Spirit in those moments indwelling you is interceding on your behalf and his intercessions are always effective because he always prays in accordance with God the Father's will. So press in further with prayer. It just might be the moments when you feel the least adequate in prayer that the greatest things will happen in prayer. In those moments when words escape you, advance. Don't press backward. Advance. And when you come to the Lord with wordless longings and you submit yourself to receive from him whatever he supplies, may your heart be encouraged. Why? Because it's a sign of life. It's a sign that you're an adopted child of God. The lost world wouldn't do that in that situation. Only God's people would do that. Only God's people would say, I don't know what's going on. I can't see how this fits. I have no words to say. And yet I'm still coming before you. It's like the disciples when Jesus turned to them and said, are you going to turn away too? They're, you have the words of eternal life. Where else are we going to go? I can go nowhere else. So in the moments when you feel least adequate, go to the Lord. And then be encouraged because in your going to him, it's a sign of your adoption. It's a further assurance that you're one of God's children. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we're sorry for neglecting prayer. We're sorry for allowing various reasons to keep us from communing with you as we ought. Sometimes it's just because we're spiritually lazy. Sometimes it's because we've just made ourselves so busy with other things that we've crowded out the important things with urgent things. Sometimes, Lord, it's because we're emotionally overwhelmed. Or we find ourselves in a place of ignorance as to not knowing what to say or pray. Lord, I pray that you would take some lessons from this text this morning and plant them deep in our hearts and minds such that these would be at the ready when that moment comes when we say, oh, I just don't, I, I, I don't know what to say. Lord, we are beset with all kinds of creaturely weaknesses and a lot of that shows itself in our ignorance. And so we gladly submit ourselves to your providence we know you as our Heavenly Father de desire and delight to give good gifts to your children, so we trust you. In all the matters where decisions could go multiple directions, we just want to submit all of those to you, asking that you would provide us with what we actually need as you know what our needs are. Lord, I pray that it would, all this would rebound to your glory, that we would find true joy and satisfaction in knowing that you are with us. Lord, help us in communicating this truth to others as well. And certainly if there are lost people that we know, if there's a moment in which prayer comes up, may you give us boldness to talk with them and reveal to them that the only way that they're going to have any sort of effective prayer is for them to first be made right with you. We pray that you would save them by your grace and for your glory and use us as ambassadors for you. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.